So, we are studying the 52 questions in the New City Catechism this year because it's a great summary of what we believe as Christians. And I'm going to read question 22 now, and then we will read the answer together. And it's also in your bulletin in all these languages. Um, so question 22 says, why must the Redeemer be truly human? Would you read with me? That in human nature, he might on our behalf perfectly obey the whole law and suffer the punishment for human sin, and also that he might sympathize with our weaknesses. Good, thank you. So Jesus is our savior and redeemer, and he came as a human being to save us from slavery to sin. And to help us understand this victory of Jesus, I want to look at the famous story about David and Goliath. Um, and it's a long story, okay? So please listen as I read this long story from chapter 17, the book of 1 Samuel. So 1 Samuel 17, verse 1 says, The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko in Judah and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. And then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail, or armor, weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. And if he kills me, we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champions strutted in front of the Israelite army. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You are only a boy, and he has been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club, and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. And if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw, and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. 
Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. And David put it on, and he strapped the sword over it, and he took a step or two to see what it was like, for he'd never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. And he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield-bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the name of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel who you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in. Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. So after we hear God's word, we read Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you because you are the source of life and truth. Jesus, we worship you because you are full of mercy and love. Holy Spirit, would you open our hearts and minds to be transformed by the word of God. Amen. So I've divided this message into two parts. Um, part A, what David did and what it meant. And part B, what Christ did and what it means for us. So part A, what David did and what it meant. And I'm going to outline it with these four things. The man, the enemy, the problem, and the victory. Okay? We're just going to go through those. So first, the man, talking about David. David is the youngest son in his family. And that is a pattern we see in the Bible. God frequently chooses the youngest son instead of the oldest or the strongest son. Think of Joseph, for example. Joseph was the youngest, but God used Joseph to save his family and everyone in Egypt. And Joseph and David are both young men who are smart and brave, and they trust in the Lord. And David's trust in the Lord is his most important value, as we will see. So second, the enemy. Goliath is a Philistine. He's an enemy of Israel. And, you know, the Philistines are not the same people as the Palestinians today. They sound similar. Um, and Israel in the Old Testament is not the same as Israel today. They have the same name, but they're not the same. I just think that's helpful to remember. Now, Goliath is a huge, arrogant, terrifying man. And Goliath insults David, he insults King Saul, he insults the Israelite army, but Goliath is also an enemy 
of God himself. Goliath curses David in the name of Dagon. Dagon is the primary Philistine god, a false god, but that's who he curses him in the name of. Now, Dagon and God are also in competition in this story. So there's a false god and the one true god, and they're both represented by a champion. Both of the champions claim that his god will win. So we have two human men fighting, but David says in verse 27, the battle is the Lord's. So third, the problem, right? David seems to be facing impossible odds, right? The apparent problem is that no one can beat Goliath. And that's obvious by this detailed description of Goliath's size and his weapons. So for 40 days, the entire Israelite army is paralyzed by fear of Goliath. And King Saul had no faith in David. Look at verse 33 on the screen. Don't be ridiculous, Saul said. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. He's been a man of war since his youth. And Goliath didn't believe that David could do it. Right? Remember what Goliath said in verses 43 and 44? He said, am I a dog that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. And he said, come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. So no one believes in David. Do you think that's, is that the real problem here? Because if that's the problem, that no one believes in David, then maybe the solution is David needs to believe in himself, right? That's the Disney movie version of the story, right? Walt Disney said, all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. You think that's true? I don't think that's true. <laughs> but we like to believe that, right? Because we want to be the hero. So do you think David is a Disney hero? Someone who followed his heart and he was true to himself? Is, is the lesson of this story that David chased his dreams and found within himself the courage to win? That's not the lesson of this story. That's the Disney lesson, but that's not the biblical lesson of this story. David isn't a hero because he believes in himself. David believes in his God, and that is the source of his victory. So let's talk about the victory. Confidence in God is the source of David's strength. He says in verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear, he will rescue me from this Philistine. So that's the first thing I want you to remember that the solution to the problem of Goliath is not David's courage. It's David's faith. That's why David doesn't wear Saul's armor. It's why he doesn't use Saul's weapons. The story emphasizes David's weakness and vulnerability. You see, God arranged for the youngest son of Jesse to face a human tank like Goliath. And the message of this story is the same one we find in Philippians 4.13. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So listen, I want you to hear this, friends. Faith is not strength. Faith is not strength. Faith is weakness holding on to strength. And the opposite of faith is not disbelief. You know what? The opposite of faith is self-reliance. And so the definition of faith, faith is your weakness holding on to God's strength. Amen. See, David is aware of his weakness, and so he depends on God for the victory. Look at verse 48. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. 
I think that's interesting. David had great confidence in God's ability to protect him. And so that's why David runs to the danger. And the battle is quick, right? It almost seems easy, like when the walls of Jericho fell down in a moment. And after Goliath falls, David uses Goliath's own sword to cut off his head. Now, I'm sure everybody in the army of Israel was yelling and celebrating about what David had done. But it was God's victory. If you notice, David never takes credit in the whole story. David never takes credit for the victory. David said in verses 45 and 47, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the army of Israel who you have defied. And today the Lord will conquer you, not David will conquer you. The Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then everyone here will know that the Lord rescues his people. This is the Lord's battle, he says. David says, this is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. So remember, friends, this is the Lord's battle. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit? I'm going to raise my hand. Who's tried to break a bad habit? Okay. Have you tried to stop doing something that you know you shouldn't do? Well, maybe you've heard somebody say something like this. Oh, that addiction... That bad habit, that's your Goliath. And you need to be strong and brave. Be like Goliath, and then you can beat that giant. You can beat that bad habit or that addiction. That's unhelpful. It doesn't help. Why is that unhelpful? I'll tell you why. Because our sin is a much bigger problem than Goliath. My sin is too big for me to defeat on my own. You see, the true problem is my heart likes to sin. <laughs> so my problem is not a giant standing over there across the valley. Do you know where the problem is? It's not over there. The problem is right here. My sin problem is here in my heart. And so if be like David is my only hope of victory over the challenges in my life, then I'm in trouble. Because it's not going to work out like a Disney movie if be like David is my only hope. See, moralism and legalism tell you what to do, but they give you no power to do it. And that's why moralism and legalism make you feel hopeless and defeated. Moralism and legalism tell you to depend on yourself to solve your problems. And therefore, you can only blame yourself when you fail. And my friends, that's right where Satan wants you to be. Satan wants you to feel alone, defeated, without God, and without hope. But my friends, there's a much better way. The gospel offers hope and victory and new life. 1 John 5.12 says this, Whoever has the Son of God has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So let's talk about what Christ did and what it means for us to have this life. Friends, victory in your life only happens when Christ does for you what you cannot do for yourself. Victory comes when Christ does for you what you can't do for yourself. Victory is found when we come to God unarmed. We come with no confidence in ourselves. And you only find victory when you surrender, when you surrender to Jesus. Because only Jesus can defeat the enemy in my heart and in your heart. See, the story about David and Goliath is really about Jesus. In fact, the whole Bible is about Jesus. You know that. If you want to correctly understand an Old Testament story like this, you should ask the question, how does this passage point me to Jesus? How does this help me see Jesus? See, David was fighting as a champion. 
David was a representative of his people. The victory or defeat of David affected everyone, even though they didn't fight. If David lost, the whole army lost, and the Israelites would become the slaves of the Philistines. And in the same way, Adam was a representative of all human beings, right? When Adam faced sin and death, Adam lost that battle. And Adam's defeat became our defeat. Sin and death were transferred to all of Adam's descendants, and that's why we're born with original sin. Romans 5.12 says this, Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. But thankfully, Jesus fixed what Adam broke. Jesus went into battle as our representative just like Adam, just like David. Jesus is the son of Adam and the son of David, and Jesus battled Satan, not Goliath. Jesus battled Satan, who's the champion of evil and sin, and Jesus fought that death and evil in our place, and Jesus won the battle. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 5.18. Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. See, the gospel is good news because it tells us that Jesus is the one who kills the giant who is too big for us. Telling me to be like David is not good news. Because if I trust in my gifts and my ability and my strength, then I'm in trouble. We're not the heroes of our stories, friends. Okay? We all want to be superheroes. Don't we all want to be superheroes? I know we want to when we're little kids, but adults, we all want to be superheroes too. Listen, my friends. You're not Batman, right? You know Batman and Robin? You're not Batman, right? You're Robin. You're the little guy. So am I, right? And you are not Luke Skywalker. You are not Princess Leia, right? You are an Ewok. <laughs> That's who we are. We're the little guy. We're the weak ones. We are not the heroes. We need to acknowledge our weakness. We need to let Jesus be the hero. That's the lesson I want you to remember. David can be a good example for us if we remember David as a flawed hero. David needed a savior just like we do. Um, David of Psalm 51 is the one we should follow as our example. We want to use David as an example. This is the David we want to follow. We read it earlier. And these are the words of a biblical hero, not a super comic book superhero, right? Listen to Psalm 51. This is a hero. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. That's the kind of humility and dependence that God values. Because even Jesus himself was humble and dependent. This is what Je Jesus said in John 5.30. He said, I can do nothing on my own. I seek not my will, but the will of him who sent me. See, David knew he could do nothing on his own. David depended on God to be the hero. And so when you read the story of David and Goliath, I want you to resist the temptation to picture yourself in David's place. Don't think of yourself in David's place. If, if we're anywhere in the story, we're the soldiers watching the battle. That's who we are. Um, imagine yourself there in the army, right? You're paralyzed with fear for 40 days. You watch helplessly as David fights a battle that you could never win. Now, 
Imagine yourself in Jerusalem on the day that Jesus died. Imagine yourself watching Jesus carry the cross, carrying our sins through the streets, and you stand helpless with the disciples as you watch Jesus die on the cross. See, Jesus went into battle as our representative, just like David did. Jesus fought Satan and sin and death and evil, and it was our sins that were buried in the earth with Jesus. And therefore, it was his resurrection that bought our freedom, our victory, our forgiveness, our new life. He won for us. Do you believe that? Have you trusted in Jesus to be your representative? And will you let Jesus win the victory for you over sin, the victory that you could never win? You see, Jesus knew that our sin problem was too big for us, and that's why Jesus stepped forward to fight our enemy. Jesus fought to release us from the captivity of Satan, and Jesus can free you from your sin and make you his follower. When he does, we become captive to the sound of his voice and the Holy Spirit's alive in our hearts. And then every Sunday, his followers, we gather here to celebrate his resurrection and his victory. You know, it's like when a country wins the World Cup. The whole country is out in the streets dancing, right? Like they won the cup. They only watched the game. They only watched the game. So we dance and sing and celebrate the victory of Jesus, who is the true hero. So friends, when we leave church tonight, we're going to go face our own battles, aren't we? But we don't face them alone, right? We leave church with confidence, not in us. We leave with confidence in our God. And we might feel weak and helpless this week, but we are never alone. We are never without hope because this is the Lord's battle and he has won the victory for us. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you. We do not have the kind of faith and courage and confidence that David had. Thank you for showing us that David's trust was in the Lord and that it wasn't in himself. Father, thank you for reminding us that God's power worked through David's weakness and faith. And Holy Spirit, would you please help us trust in the strength of Jesus? Because we can do everything through Christ who gives us strength. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus, our hero and savior. Amen.